Hello everybody, this is Joe, and today I'm going to discuss a bit of an addendum to the last book that I read in the Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever series, which was book number two, The Ill Earth War. Uh, this was published in 1977, and I think that by 1984, our author, Stephen R. Donaldson, had published two trilogies all centered around Thomas Covenant. And I think by 1984, our author had pretty much had enough of Thomas Covenant. He kind of wanted to move on and do some other things. So uh, I guess as a bit of a palate cleanser before he moved on to his next fantasy series, which was uh, Mordant's Need, uh, he published a collection of short stories in 1984, called Daughter of Regals and Other Tales. Now, what makes this collection of short stories interesting for our read-along is that it has a, a story called Guild and Fire. And Guild and Fire turns out to have been a uh, outtake from the Ill-Earth War. In other words, it was originally intended to be part of the Ill-Earth War, but was cut uh, for editorial and narrative reasons. One, it was just making the Ill-Earth War far too long. Uh, our author, Stephen Donaldson, explains that when he turned the manuscript of the Ill-Earth War into Lester Del Rey at Ballantine Books, the manuscript was 916 pages long, or 261,000 words. <laughs> and uh, uh, Lester Del Rey said, get the scalpel, you got to do some cutting. So, he had to make a decision. And what our author decided to do was cut a lot of the narrative that described the Blood Guard's missions to Sea Reach, their mission to see what was up with the giants of Sea Reach. Now, as we read it in the Ill Earth War, we have two separate, two separate accounts where Blood Guards return from that mission. And, uh, you know, tell Heil Troy, tell the Lords what had happened. We have one from the one of the oldest blood guard, Korik. Uh, he was around when one of the old patriarchs, Kevin Landwaster, was around. So we have his account. And then we have a second account of the genocide of the blood of the uh, giants done by uh, Tull, the youngest of the blood guard. So these are done as reports sent back. But this was done as a way to shorten the novel because originally the frame of reference shifted entirely to that whole mission. The lords, the uh, you know, the High Lord Elena, High Old Troy, even Thomas Covenant, none of them were around and you know, so the scene shifted to them and there was a lengthy account about their adventures on the search for, you know, their mission to Sea Reach. And so at least a portion of that is included in this story, Guild and Fire. Um, it's interesting that Thomas Co or, pardon me, it's interesting that Stephen Donaldson also says that he omitted it for logical purposes. Because if you remember my review from last time, my review of Ill, Ill Earth War, I went on this lengthy rant about the changing point of perspective from Thomas Covenant to other characters like Heil Troy, and in doing so, totally negated this whole idea of unbelief by moving the perspective to Heil Troy. We now know that there, this land is, in some sense, not a actually a hallucination uh, of Thomas Covenant's, and Thomas Covenant is not justified in his belief. And every time he doesn't believe, we know. Now that he is just foolish, he, he really is not hallucinating. And I didn't like that. Well, Stephen Donaldson says that one of the main reasons why he removed that perspective was because the perspective in Gilded Fire is on Korik of the Blood Guard. And he said, yeah, that removes the whole idea of unbelief from Thomas Covenant. So for logical purposes, he removed it. But he's still got the problem of moving it to High Old Troy, so I'm not. In, he he was not consistent in his logic. I think, nonetheless, 
this story is interesting. I mean, this this extended outtake is interesting. It's the same thing as watching deleted scenes from a movie. It's not canon, I guess you could say. It's not actually part of the final edited and published product, but it does maybe flesh out some uh, some scenes that maybe you would want explained a little bit better. And I think that this uh, story, Guild and Fire, does just that. So let me tell you a little, very briefly, about what happens. You've got two lords, Lord Shetra and Lord Hiram. You've got, I believe, 15 Bloodguard and a host of Rainihin. And that's it. And they go off on this, um, this journey to Sea Reach. Uh, Guild and Fire does not have them reach it. They go to uh, Grimmard Hoare Forest and barely survive getting out of there. And Guild and Fire kind of ends at that point. But it and it explains some of the, the hardships they encountered along the way. So some things that I thought were interesting about it is that it really fleshes out the story behind the, how the Blood Guard came to be. How you had these two tribes of the Harukai from the northern mountains and they were constantly at war with each other. Well, these two tribes... Um, decided instead to join forces because they weren't able to conquer each other. They were just slaughtering each other without conquering each other. And it was just, you know, the women and the children were, were not able to survive in this kind of situation. So they instead decided to join forces and then move south as an army and conquer re um, the land. They were going to conquer uh, Revelstone. Where, which is where High Lord Kevin lived. So they laid siege to Revelstone, and High Lord Kevin comes out, and he, you know he's one of the ancient patriarchs of the land. He's got his staff of law. He's very powerful. He knows all of this lore that he is eventually going to put into his wards, like geocaches around the land. And he tells all of these Harukai, that he is not going to fight them. He is a pacifist. Uh, he ha he, he's not going to fight them. As a matter of fact, he is going to be hospitable to them. Come in. Let me show you the marvels of Revelstone. So he brings uh, these Harukai in, including Korik and Banor, uh, people who are still alive during the time of Thomas Covenant. Well, he brings them in, shows them the marvels of this giant hewn rock of Revelstone. And the Blood Guard are so amazed by Revelstone and so taken aback by the hus hospitability uh, or hospitality of Kevin that they then and there vow the Harukai to service of the Lords. Not to the land, but to the Lords. They've kind of become their secret service. And this vow, their Harukai's strength, combined with the earth power of the land, enables them to essentially become immortal, uh, sleepless guardians of the lords. So that, uh, that origin story, I guess you could call it, of the blood guard is, is fleshed out in, in quite a bit of de detail that you don't get uh, so far in the Ill Earth War, or you know the the Lord Fowl's Bane. Um, another thing that's really fleshed out is the weakness of some of these lords in time of battle. So that's something else that I mentioned in my review. Um, without repeating myself, you know, I you know, the lords, the the people of the land were weak especially with an oncoming war. I mean, these are not warriors. They are guardians of ancient lore, but they are not soldiers or generals. They're, they're lords. And this is emphasized by Lord Hiram. Now, Lord Hiram is introduced in the Ill-Earth War, and he's kind of a, a jolly Friar Tuck kind of character. Uh, you know, a 
what's the word that you use for happy go lucky well that's that's essentially him and by the end you, you don't he goes off onto this mission and you don't see him again until they reach Koerkri. and he is reduced to a gibbering uh, senseless um, uh, panicked idiot because of the horrors that he has seen and you have sympathy for him, but there's no interim. You get that interim in Guild and Fire. You get how he is actually not really well prepared for this kind of uh, adventure. In Guild and Fire, he tries his best to ride the Rainy Heen, but he is always sore. He's nearly always in danger of falling off this powerful horse as it's walking and then when they camp for the night he collapses he can't handle it now when they see a when they enter grimmered here forest and they see a gildan that is a a maple type tree set on fire by irviles as a trap uh he rushes to put the fire out as a guardian of wood and stone and the land that is his duty the lords are guardians of the land uh, so he rushes to put it out and he uses the lore that he knows to draw water out of the ground and extinguish this fire so he's a noble character he's not a coward or a fool he's just not well suited for for the horrors of battle is, is kind of the bottom line to it. And so Guild and Fire kind of fleshes that out. And speaking of being a guardian of the land, uh, Guild and Fire also kind of fleshes out the conflicts, the, the competing agendas between the Lords and the Blood Guard. As I said, the Lords are guardians of the land. And when Hiram rushes into you know near suicide to defend the you know grimmered here forest from catching on fire the blood guard are aghast what are you doing rushing off we are here to protect you and here you go running off trying to save the land the blood guard are not duty bound to protect the land they're duty bound to the lords so there's a com uh, there's there's a conflict there that I don't see how you can resolve. Every time the lords are going to try and serve the land um, at their own expense, the blood guard are going to be in conflict with that because they're there to preserve the lords, to protect the lords. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but that that is kind of fleshed out a little bit in Guild and Fire. So there's a lot of interesting little tidbits collected in Guild and Fire that got cut out of the Ill Earth War. So the question is really, is the Ill Earth War better or worse off for having Guild and Fire cut out of it. In the end, I think Guild and Fire has to be cut from the Ill Earth War. One, 950 pages is too long. Uh, Thomas, or pardon me, <laughs> Stephen Donaldson, the author, says that uh, 150 pages of, of this quest uh, by the Blood Guard to um, Sea Reach. Uh, was cut so you know a lot had to be cut and this had to go but the other thing just from a stylistic perspective listen to how guild and fire ends i'll just read the last few sentences Korik should have been reassured but he was not the lords had proven themselves equal to wolves and grimmered whore but he had reason to know that what lay ahead would be worse period the end so it appeals to they just had a hard time they had some adventures but what lay ahead is even worse and that kind of sentence to me is a sure sign of an episodic story in other words this story is just one in a series of episodes or escapades or adventures or perils uh, that are inconsequential to an overall arch to the story. 
whether you take the story out or not doesn't matter because it's just a little episode on their long journey to Sea Reach. And that those those few sentences kind of give that away. They just had a hard time, but what lay ahead is worse. It's just an episode. Wait, you know, tune in next week for the next exciting adventure of Korok and the Blood Guard, you know. So, yeah, from a, a stylistic perspective, it had to have been cut. So anyway, there you go. An interesting little tidbit, a little bit of an addendum there to um, uh, the Ill-Earth War. Something that wound up on the old cutting room floor. So, anyway... 